We have been going through the Sermon on the Mount these last uh, few weeks, and we have arrived at the section of the Sermon on the Mount that is commonly called the Antitheses, uh, because uh, Jesus will say, well, you've heard this, but I'm going to tell you this. Uh, we went through four of the antitheses, murder, adultery, divorce, and uh, the swearing of oaths. If you followed on, uh, the next ver several verses is on, um, well, it, it begins, so let's see if you can finish it. He said, uh, you have heard an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. Excellent. Uh, and then the, so that set of antitheses regards uh, revenge and retaliation. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 we don't, let's not do that. And then the next set, um, he says, uh, you have heard love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. If you take these six antitheses, um, they kind of look a little random scholars have gone through them and to see if these six are named in any other ancient document out there uh, an ancient Jewish document uh, an ancient pagan document any ancient document at all that lists these six sort of in a block and there is none the Sermon on the Mount seems to be the one that puts these together and at first they can sort of seem like they're just sort of like jumbled together like they're they don't have any rhyme or reason why they are together, but they all six have one thing in common. They are all about the breakdown of relationships. Um, and I know that sounds a, a little funny when you consider like the first one, murder. I would say a relation, relationship is broken down, right? That's uh, it's fair to say. But notice what Jesus then does with his conversation on murder. He then takes the conversation to anger and yelling at people and calling people names. It's the breakdown of relationship. Uh, he talks about adultery, but then he then moves that over to a conversation on lust, which isn't just a breakdown of the relationship you're currently in. It's also a breakdown in your relationship with the the object of your lust, because they are no longer a person. They're, they're, they're no longer a person who has, you know, a family and friends who love them and hopes and dreams and uh, fears and worries and all of that. They are only the object of your desire. You've, re you've taken their entire humanity out of them and you've precluded any relationship with them at all. Of course, divorce is obviously the breakdown of a relationship. Uh, if you're seeking revenge or retaliation, eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, you have a breakdown of relationship. And if you're considering someone your enemy that you either have to hate or do something else with, there's not a relationship there to even be broken down. It's completely severed. The one in the middle that kind of seems like it's a little out of place and a little hard to figure out what's going on is the one about the swearing of oaths. So let me just slow down and, and tell you what's going on there, because uh, I think it sort of shows how the, the other five are, are sort of related uh, to each other. So swearing of oaths in pre-modern humanity, we're talking three, four, five, seven, ten thousand 10,000 years ago, there were no courts. There were no judges. There were no, uh, you know, civil judicial proceedings. So if you were going to make a financial deal with a neighbor, you were going to um, purchase some land from them and you were going to give them, I don't know, a hundred sheep for this parcel of land. You'd make the deal, you'd shake on it, you'd bring your sheep over to the person, they'd take the sheep, but then they could say, well, thanks for the sheep, but I'm going to keep the land. Because what are you going to do to me? Especially if the guy was bigger than you, right? Like, what are you going to do? Like, today, we would take them to civil court and sue them, and we would almost certainly win, 
right? But back then, there's no higher authority to go to to make sure that everyone's agreements were followed through with. And so what they did was they swore on their God. There's no court above us, but there is a God above us. So we'll, uh, we'll put ourselves under uh, this God, and you know, if I don't follow through, then maybe that God will, uh, will you know, give me my punishment like a, like a judge might. We have this, an artifact of this, in our culture to this day. Uh, if you go to court and you uh, are going to you know, be questioned, you're going to be put under oath, the oath is, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me, God. That comes from what we were doing five, 7,000 years ago. It's an oath to our God that I'm going to tell the truth. An oath to God that I'm going to sell you this parcel of land for your hundred sheep. The Old Testament did not forbid this at all. The Old Testament has a, a series of laws about false oaths, you it is against the laws of the Old Testament for you to swear in God's name that you're going to do something and then don't do it. Um, that's a problem. Jesus, in this antithesis, says, you've heard that you can do this, but I'm telling you, don't do that. Don't swear by God or by heaven or by earth or anything else, he says, because that whole system is based on a lack of trust. I don't trust that you're going to give me the property. You don't trust that I'm going to hand over the sheep. So we have to like uh, make, make this, you know, blood pact with God. Jesus is like, no. If you have to do that, the relationship is already broken. So just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Shake on it and be done with it. A couple weeks ago, I went to do some uh, yard work uh, for my mom. And before I left, I went to our neighbor to borrow his chainsaw. And I texted him, can I borrow your chainsaw? He said, yep. Uh, and on the day I was going down to see my mom, I drove over, I picked up the chainsaw. He didn't hand me a contract. He didn't make me swear to God that I was going to bring it back in the same condition that I took it and fully charged. Like, no, no. If he had done that, if he had he is a lawyer. If he had whipped out a if he had whipped out a contract, wouldn't that have been awkward? It'd been strange because what that would have said is that there was a breakdown in our relationship. He couldn't trust that I would just take the thing and bring it back in the same condition. These six antitheses are all about the building up of healthy relationships, a healthy community of relationships. You could, you could talk about it in terms of a community that loves its neighbor. You could talk about it as a community of people who regard each other as people, children of God, created in the image of God. Jesus is talking about creating a world where people are not ruled by their anger, where people are not ruled by lust, where people are not ruled by the thirst for revenge, while people, where people are not ruled by hatred for anyone, the creating of any en enemies. A world where people when we make commitments and promises, we follow through with them. Which sounds pretty good, right? I mean, that sounds like a pretty good world. And they didn't do it in Jesus' day. And how are we doing today? I mean, are, are, are we a world that is in many ways fueled by anger? and lust, and the lust for retaliation, and the hatred of enemies. We have uh, 
Uh, we particularly love this in my household, and you'll understand why very quickly. The, the rise of the Karens. You know what I'm talking about? The eight, eight o'clockers didn't know what I was talking about. Was, I, I had to explain it. The hairdo, the whole, you know. But it, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a phrase I, as, I, as I was looking up the rise of the Karens uh, this week to talk about it. Um, the consumer rage is a thing now. Uh, it's a thing that corporations and companies are trying to like mitigate against. Corporate rage, where people come in to your store, your grocery store, whatever it is, and start yelling at the employees, or people on an airplane start yelling or swinging at the stewards. I feel like I, I, I don't think it's just that we now have a camera in our pocket at all times. I feel like this is something that is new. We are becoming a people that are more and more ruled by anger. There's more and more a division of people, divisions among so many different lines, the creation of enemies, enemies that are not just other human beings, but are also, you know, fellow Americans. Jesus is about creating a world that is very different than the world that is being created. And we are invited by him in the Sermon on the Mount to help build that world. And the thing is, we do have it within us to do it. And we know it. And we see it. It's just that it takes usually a disaster of epic proportions for us to actually make it happen. It takes a massive terrorist attack. It takes a tsunami. It takes an earthquake in Turkey or Syria. And all of a sudden, a country and a world are united. Israel, uh, who are not friendly with Turkey at all and our enemies with Syria after the earthquake this past week offered to send their own people to uh, help in the search and rescue operation. They went to Turkey. They haven't been invited to Syria yet. But with all the enmity, all the strife, all the anger, all the enemy line drawing, and Israel said, we're just humans. We're going to put all that aside for a bit. We'll go back to it. We promise. But right here, we're going to help dig your people out of the rubble. Because right here, none of that matters. None of that other stuff matters. What matters is life. We have that within us. It's just it usually takes a disaster for us to see an emergency situation to do it. When I feel like as Christians, we should be able to see the Sermon on the Mount as an, emer as an emergent situation enough to regard other people as fellow humans and fellow citizens, fellow people made in the image of God, neighbors, even enemies, to be loved. At, at the core, I think, of all of this is a willingness to see other people, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter who they vote for, no matter any of that, that they are people. We could, as Christians, take that one step further and we could see them as Jesus. If we saw them as Jesus, we wouldn't get angry with them and call them names. We wouldn't go back on our commitments to them. We wouldn't seek retaliation and we certainly wouldn't hate them. We actually have this baked into our liturgy. Every single Sunday when uh, we gather, when, when Jesus is talking about anger here, he says, if you have something going on with your neighbor, before you go to the altar, leave your gift and go and make good with your neighbor, and then you come to the altar. Every, in, in, you know, in a few moments we're going to do the, the creed and the, the prayers, um, the confession of sin, we'll bless a blanket, and we'll pass the peace. It's a moment that's baked into our liturgy where we are to pass peace amongst each other. 
it's, it was actually put in there so that if there was like, there was like a little tiff going on between a couple people in the congregation that you would go over to them and say, I'm so sorry, let's get through this together. And then you would be able to come to the altar and receive Jesus's body and blood as brothers and sisters without this thing between you. We have it baked into our liturgy to see other people as people, as Christ. The only next step is to take that piece out of these doors with us. To see people as people. And to create a community that is not broken. And we're human. Relationships break. Relationships fracture. People get angry. People get upset. Marriages fall apart. Like, these things happen. We're, we, we are not perfect people. But we can always go back to our common humanity, to our common status as bearers of the divine image and as neighbors worthy of love.